On a fateful day in April 1846, a caravan of nine covered wagons embarked on a perilous 2,500-mile journey from Springfield, Illinois to California. Little did they know that their voyage would go down in history as one of the most tragic events of westward migration. James Fraser Reed, an Illinois businessman with dreams of building a fortune in California, was the driving force behind the group that would become known as the Donner Party. Reed hoped that the coastal climate would improve his wife Margaret's health as she suffered from terrible headaches. He was enticed by a book he had read, The Emigrant's Guide to Oregon and California by Lansford W. Hastings, which advertised a new shortcut across the Great Basin that would save travelers 350 to 400 miles on easy terrain. But what Reed didn't know was that this route had never been tested and was written by a man with grandiose visions of building an empire at Sutter's Fort. This false information would ultimately lead to the downfall of the Donner Party. Reed soon found others eager to join him on his journey to the West, including families such as the Donners, Graves, Breens, Murphys, Eddies, McCutcheons, Keysbergs, and Wolfingers, as well as Teamsters and Bachelors. The initial group consisted of 32 men, women, and children. Reed's own family included his wife Margaret, their four children Virginia, Patty, James, and Thomas, Margaret's 70-year-old mother Sarah Keyes who was suffering from consumption, and two hired servants. Despite her illness, Sarah was determined to accompany her daughter on the journey. Reed spared no expense in ensuring his family's comfort on the long journey. Their wagon was a lavish two-story affair with an iron stove, spring cushion seats, and bunks for sleeping. Pulled by eight oxen and dubbed the Pioneer Palace Car by Reed's 12-year-old daughter Virginia, it seemed as though nothing could stand in their way. In nine brand new wagons, the group set out on their journey to California, estimating that it would take them four months to cross the plains, deserts, mountain ranges, and rivers. Their first stop was Independence, Missouri, the main starting point for the Oregon and California trails. Among the group were the families of George and Jacob Donner. George, a successful 62-year-old farmer, had migrated five times before settling in Springfield, Illinois with his brother Jacob. Despite their age, the adventurous brothers decided to make one last trip to California, a decision that would ultimately prove fatal. George was accompanied by his third wife Tamzine, their three children Francis, Georgia and Eliza and his two daughters from a previous marriage Elitha and Leanna. Jacob and his wife Elizabeth brought their five children George, Mary, Isaac, Samuel and Louis as well as Elizabeth's two children from a previous marriage Solomon and William Hook. The group also included two teamsters Noah James and Samuel Shoemaker and a friend named John Denton. Tucked away in Jacob Donner's saddlebag was a copy of Lansford Hastings' Emigrant's Guide with its alluring promise of a faster route to the promised land. Ironically, on the very day that the group set out from Springfield, Lansford Hastings himself was preparing to leave California to see for himself what the shortcut he had written about was really like. Three weeks after setting out from Springfield, the wagon train arrived in Independence, Missouri to resupply. The very next day, on May 12, 1846, they continued their journey westward in the midst of a thunderstorm. A week later, they joined forces with a large wagon train led by Colonel William H. Russell, camped on Indian Creek about 100 miles west of Independence. As they journeyed on, more and more people joined the group until it numbered 87. On May 25th, the wagon train was delayed for several days by high water at the Big Blue River near present-day Marysville, Kansas. It was here that the group suffered its first loss when Sarah Keyes passed away and was buried beside the river. After constructing ferries to cross the water, the party continued on their way, following the Platte River for the next month. At Fort Laramie, they were joined by other wagons, and on July 11th, at the Continental Divide, they were met by a man bearing a letter from Lansford W. Hastings. 
The letter stated that Hastings would meet them at Fort Bridger and guide them along his shortcut which passed south of the Great Salt Lake instead of detouring northwest via Fort Hall, present-day Pocatello, Idaho. The letter from Lansford Hastings put to rest any doubts the group may have had about taking his shortcut. On July 19th, the wagon train arrived at the Little Sandy River in present-day Wyoming where the trail split into two routes, the well-traveled northern route and the untested Hastings cut off. At this point, the group divided, with most choosing to take the safer northern route. Those who opted for the Hastings cut off elected George Donner as their leader and set off on the southern route, reaching Fort Bridger on July 28th. But when they arrived at Fort Bridger there was no sign of Hastings, only a note he had left with other emigrants at the fort. The note stated that he had left with another group and that they should follow and catch up. Jim Bridger and his partner Luis Vasquez assured the Donner party that the Hastings cut off was a good route and so, after resting for a few days to make repairs to their wagons and prepare for what they believed would be a seven-week journey, they set off again on July 31st, joined by the McCutcheon family. The group now numbered 74 people in 20 wagons and made good progress for the first week, covering 10 to 12 miles per day. On August 6, they reached the Weber River after passing through Echo Canyon but were brought to a halt by another note from Hastings warning them not to follow him down Weber Canyon as it was impassable. Instead, he advised them to take another trail through the Salt Basin. While the group camped near present-day Hannaford, Utah, James Reed and two other men rode ahead on horseback to catch up with Hastings. They found him at the south shore of the Great Salt Lake and he accompanied Reed partway back to show them the new route which he said would take about a week to travel. While James Reed was away, the Graves family caught up with the Donner Party, bringing their numbers to 87 people in 23 wagons. After taking a vote, the group decided to try the new trail rather than backtrack to Fort Bridger. On August 11th, they set off on the difficult journey through the Wasatch Mountains, clearing trees and other obstacles as they went. Progress was slow, at first they were lucky to cover even two miles a day and it took them six days just to travel eight miles. Along the way they were forced to abandon some of their wagons and morale began to plummet as they blamed Lance for Hastings and James Reed for their predicament. On August 25th they lost another member of their party when Luke Halloran died of consumption near present-day Grantsville, Utah. Fear began to set in as their supplies dwindled and time was running out. In the 21 days since reaching the Weber River they had only managed to cover 36 miles. On August 30th, the group set out to cross the Great Salt Lake Desert, believing it would take them only two days as Hastings had claimed. But they soon discovered that the desert sand was deep and moist, causing their wagons to sink and slowing their progress considerably. By the third day in the desert, their water supply was almost gone and some of Reed's oxen had run away. When they finally reached the end of the desert five days later on September 4th, they rested near Pilot Peak for several days. During their 80-mile journey through the Salt Lake Desert, they had lost a total of 32 oxen and Reed was forced to abandon two of his wagons while the Donners and Lewis Kiesberg each lost one. On the other side of the desert, the group took stock of their food supplies and found them to be dangerously low for the 600-mile journey that still lay ahead. That night snow dusted the mountain peaks. They reached the Humboldt River on September 26th. In an effort to replenish their supplies, two young men from the group, William McCutcheon and Charles Stanton, were sent ahead to Sutter's Fort in California to bring back provisions. From September 10th to 25th, the party followed the trail into Nevada around the Ruby Mountains and finally reached the Humboldt River on September 26th, where their new trail met up with Hastings' original path. Having traveled an extra 125 miles through difficult mountain terrain and dry desert, their resentment towards Hastings and Reed grew even stronger. The Donner Party soon reached the junction with the California Trail about seven miles west of present-day Elko, Nevada and spent the next two weeks traveling along the Humboldt River. As tempers flared within the group, 
An incident occurred on October 5th at Iron Point when two wagons became entangled. John Snyder, a teamster of one of the wagons began whipping his oxen and when James Reed ordered him to stop and he refused, Reed grabbed his knife and stabbed Snyder in the stomach, killing him. The group quickly administered their own justice although Louis Kiesberg favored hanging Reed, they instead voted to banish him. Reed left his family behind and was last seen riding off to the west with a man named Walter Heron. The Donner Party continued along the Humboldt River with their remaining draft animals exhausted and everyone who could walk doing so to spare them. Two days after the Snyder killing, on October 7th, Louis Kiesberg turned away a Belgian man named Hardcoop who had been traveling with him. The old man's feet were so swollen he could not keep up with the rest of the group and when he knocked on other wagon doors for help, no one would let him in. He was last seen sitting under a large sagebrush, completely exhausted and unable to go on. He was left there to die. The group's troubles continued to melt while October 12th their oxen were attacked by Piute Indians who killed 21 of them with poison-tipped arrows, further depleting their already exhausted draft animals. On October 16th they reached the gateway to the Sierra Nevada on the Truckee River, present-day Reno, with their food supplies almost completely depleted. But just three days later on October 19th one of the men they had sent ahead to Fort Sutter, Charles Stanton, returned with seven meals loaded with beef and flour, two Indian guides and news of a clear but difficult path through the Sierra Nevada. Stanton's partner William McCutcheon had fallen ill and remained at the fort. The group camped for five days 50 miles from the summit to rest their oxen for the final push a decision that would ultimately contribute to their tragedy. On October 28th, James Reed arrived at Sutter's Fort exhausted where he met William McCutcheon who had now recovered. The two men began making preparations to go back for their families. As the wagon train continued towards the base of the summit, George Donner's wagon axle broke and he fell behind the rest of the group. 22 people, including the Donner family and their hired men, stayed behind to make repairs. But while cutting timber for a new axle, Donner accidentally cut his hand badly with a chisel and the group fell even further behind. As the rest of the party continued onto what is now known as Donner Lake, snow began to fall. Stanton and the two Indians who were traveling ahead reached the summit but could go no further and were forced to turn back as five feet of new snow had already fallen. With the Sierra Pass just 12 miles away, the wagon train made several attempts to cross through the heavy snow but eventually retreated to the eastern end of the lake where there was level ground and plenty of timber. There was already one cabin at the lake and realizing they were stranded, the group built two more to shelter 59 people in the hope that the early snow would melt and allow them to continue their journey. The 22 people with the Donners were about six miles behind at Alder Creek. As the snow continued to fall they hastily built three shelters from tents, quilts, buffalo robes and brush to protect themselves from the harsh conditions. At Donner Lake two more attempts were made to cross over the pass through 20 feet of snow before they finally realized they were trapped for the winter. More small cabins were built, many shared by more than one family. The weather did not improve and neither did their hopes. Over the next four months the remaining men, women and children huddled together in cabins, makeshift lean-tos and tents. Meanwhile, Reed and McCutcheon had set out to rescue their stranded companions. Two days into their journey it began to rain and as they climbed higher the rain turned to snow. Twelve miles from the summit they could go no further and were forced to leave their provisions in Bear Valley before returning to Sutter's Fort to recruit more men and supplies for the rescue. But the Mexican War had drawn away all the able-bodied men and any further rescue attempts had to be postponed. Not knowing how many cattle the stranded group had lost, Reed and McCutcheon believed they would have enough meat to last them several months. On Thanksgiving it began to snow again and on November 29th the pioneers at Donner Lake killed their last oxen for food. The next day five more feet of snow fell, dashing any hopes of leaving. Many of their animals, 
including Sutter's mules, had wandered off into the storm and their bodies were lost under the snow. A few days later their last remaining cattle were slaughtered for food and the group resorted to eating boiled hides, twigs, bones and bark. Some of the men tried to hunt, but with little success. On December 15th, Ballas Williams died of malnutrition and the group realized they had to do something before they all perished. The next day, five men, nine women and one child set out on snowshoes for the summit, determined to make the 100 mile journey to Sutter's Fort. But with only meager rations and already weakened by hunger, they faced a daunting challenge. On the sixth day their food ran out and for the next three days they traveled through freezing winds and bitter cold without eating. One member of the party, Charles Stanton, became snowblind and exhausted and was unable to keep up with the rest of the group. He told them to go on without him. Stanton never rejoined the group. A few days later they were caught in a blizzard and struggled to light and keep a fire going. Antonio. Patrick Dolan, Franklin Graves, and Lemuel Murphy soon died and in desperation the others resorted to cannibalism. Surviving on the bodies of those who had died along the way, only seven of the snowshoeing party made it to safety on the western side of the mountains on January 19, 1847. Only two of the ten men, William Eddy and William Foster, survived but all five women made it through. Of the eight who died, seven had been cannibalized. Messages were immediately sent to neighboring settlements and residents rallied to save the rest of the Donner Party. On February 5th, the first relief party of seven men set out from Johnson's Ranch and two days later a second party led by James Reed followed. On February 19th, the first party reached the lake and at first it seemed as though they had found a deserted camp until a ghostly figure of a woman appeared. Twelve of the emigrants were dead, and of the forty-eight remaining many had gone mad or were barely clinging to life. But their nightmare was far from over. Not everyone could be taken out at once, and since no pack animals could be brought in, few food supplies were brought in. The first relief party left with twenty-three refugees, but two more children died on the journey back to Sutter's Fort. On their way down the mountains, they met the second relief party coming up, and after five months, the Reed family was finally reunited. On the 1st of March, the second relief party stumbled upon a gruesome scene at the lake evidence of cannibalism. The following day, they discovered that the Donners at Alder Creek had also turned to such desperate measures. On the 3rd of March, Reed led 17 emaciated immigrants out of the camp, but just two days later they were engulfed by another blizzard. When the storm subsided, Isaac Donner had perished and most of the refugees were too feeble to continue. Reed, another rescuer, Hiram Miller, took three refugees with them in search of food they had stashed along the way. The remaining pioneers hunkered down at what would become known as Starf Camp. On the 12th of March, the third relief party led by William Eddy and William Foster arrived at Starf Camp to find that Mrs. Graves and her son Franklin had also passed away. The three bodies, including Isaac Donner's, had been cannibalized. The following day, they reached the lake camp only to discover that both of their sons had died. On the 14th of March, they arrived at Alder Creek Camp to find George Donner on his deathbed from an infected hand injury he had sustained months prior. His wife Tamzine, though relatively healthy, refused to leave his side and sent her three young daughters ahead without her. The relief party soon departed with four more members of the party, leaving behind those too weak to travel. Two rescuers. Sean Baptiste Trudeau and Nicholas Clark were tasked with caring for the Donners, but soon abandoned them to catch up with the relief party. A fourth rescue party set out in late March, but were quickly stranded in a blinding snowstorm for several days. On the 17th of April, the relief party arrived at the camps to find only Louis Keysburg alive amidst the mutilated remains of his former companions. Keysburg was the final member of the Donner Party to reach Sutter's Fort on the 29th of April. It took two grueling months and four relief parties to rescue all of the surviving members of the Donner Party. In this tragedy, 
two-thirds of the men perished while two-thirds of the women and children survived. 41 individuals lost their lives and 46 survived. In the end, five died before reaching the mountains, 35 perished either at the mountain camps or while attempting to cross the mountains, and one passed away just after reaching the valley. Many survivors suffered from frostbitten toes. News of the Donner tragedy spread like wildfire across the nation. Newspapers published letters and diaries and accused the travelers of heinous acts such as cannibalism and murder. The surviving members had conflicting viewpoints, biases and recollections so the truth remained shrouded in mystery. Some pointed fingers at Lansford W. Hastings for leading them astray while others blamed James Reed for ignoring Clyman's warning about the perilous route. Following the media frenzy, emigration to California plummeted and Hastings' cutoff was all but forgotten. Then, in January 1848, gold was discovered at John Sutter's mill in Coloma and fortune seekers began flocking westward once more. By late 1849, over 100,000 people had journeyed to California in search of gold near the very streams and canyons where the Donner Party had endured such hardship. Today, Donner Lake, named after the ill-fated party, is a popular mountain resort near Truckee, California, and the Donner Camp has been designated a National Historic Landmark. Recent archaeological excavations have taken place at the Donner Camp. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and press the bell icon to get new video updates.